construction company. He and his partner, Andrew DeWitt, who is sitting at the table there, founded the company in February 2015 after seeing the need for a Savannah firm that is focused solely on new construction and one that can carefully manage every aspect of a project from pre-construction through completion. Tilton and DeWitt each bring 25 years of experience to the table, much of it in the Savannah market, along with strong portfolios of successful building projects. The firm brings financial strength, industry relationships, and outstanding reputation to work on every project. Tilton says construction is in his blood. His father was a South Carolina low country home builder, and Tilton was often at the side of his father's uh, at the side of his father's trim carpenter, learning the business as a hands-on helper. After graduating with honors from Georgia Institute of Technology with a Bachelor of Science in the field of building construction, Tilton honed his skills while working with several large construction firms in the Savannah and Atlanta markets. He later founded the Tilton Commercial Group and JHT Construction prior to co-founding the DeWitt Tilton Group. He was born in Savannah, although he spent his early childhood years on Tilton Head, where his father was one of only three home builders at the time. He moved back to Savannah when he was eight, and attended St. James Catholic School before graduating from Benedictine Mil Military School, where he and DeWitt became friends. He is married to Christy, an engagement manager at Microsoft, and has four children, Peter, John Clark, Jessica, and Christian. He enjoys fishing and is a big history buff. Please welcome Chris. <laughs> And thank you for you guys inviting us here to speak today. And I can tell you, after spending about 45 minutes with you, I just hope I don't bore you to death because you are a fun and energetic group. <laughs> so today, today we're going to talk about five things to consider before doing a commercial project. As Cindy said, I grew up in Savannah and I went to St. James, graduated from BC in 1985. I went off to Atlanta to go to Georgia Tech and every summer I came home to work with my dad in the building business. Around 1987, 1988, my dad sent me off to work with Robert Graves, a builder he started with in 1964. Uh, Robert was a, a tough builder. His family had been around for years. Uh, in fact, the bridge to Hilton Head is the Wilton J. Graves Memorial Bridge, which is named after his father. So I got to the job the first day, and I was 20 years old, a student at Georgia Tech, and full of knowledge. And I really didn't think I needed anybody to tell me how to do it. Well, I walked around the site with Robert and he showed me we need to have ingress for the trucks over here and we need egress over here and we need a place to stage the materials and we need to put silk vents up and erosion controls and we need to have utilities and where are we going to put the job sign. And I realized there's a lot more to building than just vertical construction. So that kind of leads me into five things to consider before starting a construction project. First thing is stormwater management. Prior to the 1980s, stormwater management simply meant flood control. Basically, the communities wanted to get the water into the pipes, get it to the streams or rivers, get it to the aquatic resources, and get rid of it. During the 1980s, communities started focusing on not only the quantity of water, but also the quality of the water. In 1990, phase one of the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System, better known for its acronym NPDES, was initiated. In 1999, phase two of the NPDES was introduced. With these two acts, local communities began to revise and expand their local stormwater management programs, and they really wanted to focus more on prevention than mitigation. In 2009, the NPC began work on the Coastal Stormwater Supplement to the Georgia Stormwater Management Manual. And finally, in April 2012, they implemented the Stormwater Management Ordinance. So what is the stormwater management ordinance and how does it impact development? Well, basically what they wanted to do was again, continue controlling the quantity and quality of water that was being discharged into the local streams and rivers. They also wanted to make sure that developers and builders weren't stopping the water from flowing. So what the biggest thing they initiated was for every load of dirt you bring to a site, you're required to take a load of dirt off of the site. Now, if you're building a big, uh, developing a big tract of land or a new project, it's pretty easy to do that. You can, you can mitigate here and mitigate there. Well, if you're developing, if you're working on a smaller site, for instance, we just developed a 0.8 acre site that was within a business park. 
We wanted to do a slab on grade, as many commercial uh, projects are slab on grade. We needed about 1,200 cubic yards of dirt to bring the slab up to the, above the flood level. Well, there was no way to get 1,200 cubic yards off of a site that was only eight cents of an acre. So we re redesigned the project to do a crawl space. Well, even with a crawl space, you still need dirt, and we needed about 400 cubic yards. Still couldn't do it on a site that size. So we hired a civil engineer who mitigated it, and he actually looked at the common retention within the same whole development, and we were able to mitigate some of the soils that we brought on for the soils that were taken off when the project was first developed. Now, this is even crept into residential. Uh, I, I've heard of lots on several islands that are low lots. They've been under contract, but because of the Stormwater Management Act, they're saying you cannot bring the dirt in, therefore those lots aren't buildable. Well, I would say talk to a civil engineer because there's probably some mitigation credits within the entire development, such as the common retention. At the very least, those lots will have a pro rata share of whatever common retention is within that development. So stormwater management, be wary of it, but don't be afraid of it because it can be handled. The next thing is architecture and engineering. And I think a lot of people that start out with a commercial project are saying, well, well do I need an architect? Do I need an engineer? Well, every municipality is different. Most municipalities are require either an architect or an engineer to design the building. Once the building is designed, you need a structural engineer to design the structural part of the building. For instance, if you're building a class S metal steel building, you'd hire a structural engineer to do the slab, and the steel manufacturer would, man would engineer the, the metal part of the building. Once you have the structural on the drawings, you need an MEP engineer. An MEP engineer is a mechanical, electrical, plumbing engineer. And basically what they do is design the systems that go in the building, they draw the schematics, and that part is needed for the building permit. And finally, you need a civil engineer. And again, you wouldn't think for a site that's 0.8 acres within a plan development that you would need a civil engineer, but you do for a commercial project. And basically, the civil engineer would do the civil utility drawings, the drainage plan, the uh, the uh, temporary driveway, erosion control measures, and the final landscape plan. And all, all of these engineers and architects are required to do a commercial project to get a building and a development permit. The third thing is timing and permitting. And believe me, if you can get the permitting done, you're halfway home for a commercial project. Once you have your drawings, you need to submit plans to get permits. The first permit you would get would be the development permit. And again, municipalities are all different, but most municipalities have two or three readings for a development permit. And these readings occur once a month. So you would submit your plans to the reading for the first month, they would make comments, you correct those comments, submit it for the second reading, they approve it, third reading, you get your uh, development permit, but you have to have two pre-con meetings, at least one, maybe two pre-con meetings. And basically what you do at a pre-con meeting, you meet with the utility contractor, the city engineer, the civil engineer, you meet on site or at their administration buildings, and they discuss things like utilities and erosion control measures. And once you have all these permits, you still need to think about one thing before you go vertical, and it's temporary utilities. And you need to apply for your water meter, you need to apply for temporary service, and again, these things can really hold you up. The job we're doing on the 0.8 acre site, we applied for temporary service seven weeks ago. We still don't have power because this uh, subdivision was pretty much vacant for 10 years and they had never run the power lines to that side of the street. So again, if you, you gotta think about timing and permitting. And again, if you can get the permitting done, you're really halfway home. The fourth thing is probably the most critical of all things and it's site conditions. And when you think about site conditions, we're really talking about the dirt. And as one large developer and pooler said not too long ago, I don't want to ever hear the two words pooler gumbo again. <laughs> well, let me tell you, there's a reason that the sites that we're now trying to build on and buy are the last ones left, because they have what we would say the most challenging dirt out there. So the first thing you would want to do if you're looking at a site and you're thinking about buying it and building a project on it, you want to get a geotech analysis on it. Basically what a geotech analysis is, they come in, they core 5, 10, 20, 40 feet, they look at the surface conditions of the soil, and they look at the subsurface conditions of the soil. Now most of the times the subsurface conditions are going to be pretty good. It's the surface conditions that are going to have problems. When you have problems, there's several ways you can go about. Sometimes you have to remove the soils, which is often referred to as mucking, 
and bring in structural soils. Well, other times you can bridge over the unsuitable soils with suitable soils. And again, that would be determined by your geotech engineer, your civil engineer, and your structural engineer. Another thing that needs to be considered on site conditions is utilities. Again, you, you buy a lot within a plan development, you assume all the utilities are there, and that's often not the case. You still need to run a fire line to the building, you need to get your utilities to the site and then to the buildings, and that can really add up an expense if you're not prepared for it. The last thing to consider is location, 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 and that really is not just a real estate catchphrase. If you're considering building, obviously the first thing you think about location-wise is where do you need to be for your business. Once you establish that, you need to think about do I need to be in Savannah or can I be in Chatham County? The Chatham County tax base is less than Savannah tax base. Now once you establish where you want to be, you need to consider things like exposure. We've actually, we've actually seen lots of pooler where this lot is exposure B and this lot is exposure C. Exposure C lot needs to be designed to 140 mile per hour winds, whereas exposure B lot has to be designed for 110 mile per hour winds. And there's a significant cost in both design and building if you have to go to exposure C designs. Another one is your floodplain. Um, again, you could have a site that's at A11 uh, elevation here that's required to be at 12 feet above sea level. Down the street, you could have an A13 that's required to be at 14 feet above sea level. That's two feet of fill on the whole site. And again, that can add up very, very quickly. The last thing to think about is earthquake zones. We actually do have earthquake zones here in Savannah. Um, and again, if you can stay out of an earthquake zone, you're gonna save a lot of money on design as well as building. So we all would probably agree that if you ride around Savannah, Savannah cityscape is one of the most beautiful in the United States of America. And as you look around at those buildings, think about the months and probably years that went into the planning and, and to the pre-construction phases of each one of those buildings. And again, I try to make it a little quicker today because y'all are such fun, I don't want to tie you up with a long speech. So if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer yes, sir. Uh, number four, um, the whole soil question, and you call those engineers what? Geotechnical engineers. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm not gonna ask the question right, so I'm just gonna give you an example. There's a large project down in Hinesville uh, last year it was completed and the Liberty Center became a nice structure down there. Um, um, but when when they started digging dirt, they found um, a couple of gas tanks.